you got your Bible with you this morning, please be opening to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, that is where we're going to find a beginning place for our study. It's where we're going to spend most of our time together this morning. So if you've got your New Testament with you, be opening up there, Juan Capitulo Tres, John chapter 3, and we'll get started in just a few moments. We have visitors in our audience today. We are so thankful that you're here. If you're able to stick around a little while after services so that we could meet you and get to know you a little bit better, we sure would appreciate that. We'll be meeting again this evening at 5 o'clock, and we'd love for you to join with us then if you have the opportunity. We're looking forward to our gospel meeting beginning next Sunday, going through Wednesday night with Brother Adonis Bailey from just outside of Kansas City, Missouri. We're looking forward to uh, his good work. Uh, John, I believe it's your nephew, David, who is going to be over at Live Oak in Kerrville n starting next Friday. Is that right? Yes. So we're looking forward to both of those opportunities to study the gospel together. We're in John chapter 3 this morning. If you've got your Bible open up there. Uh, we're going to look at, at probably what is the most famous verse of the New Testament this morning. And we're going to look at this verse in a very unapologetic way. Do you feel sometimes when we're talking with our friends in the religious world, uh, and, and they perhaps know our feelings on baptism, does John chapter 3 and verse 16 sometimes present a difficult text to work through with friends? Uh, sometimes it's as simple as, well, this is what the passage says, Tyler. Don't you believe in this? And I would hope all of us would say, yes. Yes, I believe in John chapter 3 and verse 16. But I don't believe that John chapter 3 and verse 16 is the only message of God to man, is the only revelation of what man needs to do to be saved. And I think if we spend a little bit of time there this morning together, I think we can see that for ourselves. We want to talk this morning about what it means simply to believe. You'll notice as we read John chapter 3 and verse 16 together, this is what we are called to do. This is what man is called to do in response to the wonderful working of God in Christ Jesus. John chapter 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We simply want to talk this morning about what it means to believe. And we want to emphasize for ourselves the necessity of belief. What does it mean here to believe? I want you to look with me in chapter 3, and, and you can go back up with me to verse 1, and let's set a context for ourselves. This entire conversation we see playing out here up to verse 16 stems from Jesus' interaction with a Pharisee, seemingly a godly Pharisee, by the name of Nicodemus, who comes and asks Jesus about being born again. Verse 4, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb, can he? Uh, Nicodemus' question seems to be along the lines of what Jesus has said in verse 3, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Think about Nicodemus, this most preeminent of, of Pharisees here, and Jesus has just presented to him that there, there's still more you need to do. And as Nicodemus is sorting through this in his own mind, it's almost as if he's asking the question, well, Jesus, how can I be any more Jewish than I already am? Can I enter into my mother's womb and be born a Jew a second time? And Jesus is going to, of course, demonstrate, no, that, that's not the point. He's going to talk to him in chapter 3 and verse 5 about baptism, being born of water and the Spirit. And in verse 9, Nicodemus is going to say to Jesus, well, how can these things be? And Jesus says in verse 10, are you a teacher of Israel and do you not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak that which we know and bear witness of that which we have seen and you do not receive our witness. I'll just say very quickly and parenthetically, I think the we there and the our there and the us there, I think that's Jesus and John the Baptist. Now, you can tell me I'm wrong later and we can fuss about that later. But I think Jesus is, is pulling John the Baptist and his witness into this testimony as well. Verse 12, Jesus says this, 
If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? In verse 13, where we're going to pick up this morning in our study, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, even the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. When we're talking about belief and what belief encompasses here in John chapter 3 and verse 16, I'm going to submit to you this morning that the belief talked about in John chapter 3 and verse 16 is not merely believe in Jesus. It embraces belief in Jesus, and don't get me wrong, it embraces believing in Jesus, but it embraces So much more than that. Start in verse 13 with me, if you would, where we read this. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, even the Son of Man. Now, now just on its own and isolated, that's a confusing statement, isn't it? Right, because we can think about Elijah, who ascended into heaven. We can think about Enoch, who did not experience death, but was called up to God because he walked with God. We can think of those two people real quick. That ascended into heaven. So then is Jesus wrong here? Uh, if, If that's what Jesus was intending, I would submit to you that Nicodemus, who seems to be this preeminent Pharisee, who was very schooled in the law, would no doubt have brought that up. Well, what about Enoch? What about Elijah? But the fact that Nicodemus says nothing here, I think, indicates to us He understands that's not what Jesus is saying. Uh, You got your Old Testament with you? I want you to open up to one Old Testament passage really quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomio capitulo 30. uh, Verso 12. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 12. What Jesus references here is an Old Testament passage, an Old Testament passage that is cited numerous times in the New Testament, uh, not as famous here in John 3 as it is more famous in Romans chapter 10, where Paul through the Spirit talks about uh, descending into the abyss or ascending into heaven, but it's still spoken of in the context of the gospel message revealing God's plan to man. I would submit to you the same thing is going on here when Jesus alludes in John chapter 3 and verse 13 back to Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 12. Actually, verse 11. Better so on say. Here is Moses speaking to the children of Israel. He says, For this commandment, verse 11, which I command to you today, is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of reach. It is not in heaven that you should say who will go up to heaven for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it, nor is it beyond the sea that you should say who will cross the sea for us to get it and make us hear it that we may observe it, but the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may observe it. Uh, The point of John chapter 3 and verse 13 referencing Deuteronomy 30 is the same usage as Paul referencing Deuteronomy 30 in Romans chapter 10. The point is this, God's revelation is not so far beyond us, away from us, that we can't grasp it, understand it, and respond to it. When we are called to believe in John chapter 3 and verse 16, part of what we're being called to believe is the revelation that comes through Jesus Christ. Look here at chapter 3 again, this time in verse 12. Notice the context in which Jesus makes this statement. If I have told you earthly things, so here's the the, the context of revelation. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven. Here's our allusion to Deuteronomy 30. This revelation from me is not beyond you. It does not escape you. It's not too far beyond your ability to comprehend. The word is near you. That's how Paul will phrase it in Romans chapter 10. The word is near you. It's not in heaven that somebody has to go and get it for you. But this word 
that was in heaven has come down, descended from heaven, even the Son of Man. Do you remember how Jesus was introduced at the beginning of John's gospel account? In the beginning was the Word, John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And skipping down to verses 13 and 14, that Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is described in John's Gospel account, the very beginning of John's Gospel account, as the Word of God, the communication to man of who God is and what God desires. When we look at Jesus, when we understand Jesus, when we hear Jesus, when we believe in Jesus, we understand who the Father is and what the Father wants from us. This is at least part of what Jesus is saying here in John chapter 3 and verse 13. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, even the Son of Man. I have come down from heaven, Jesus says, by implication in this passage, to share God's will with you, which is exactly what John writes in chapter 1. That if we want to know God's will, we look to Jesus and we listen to Jesus. So when you and I are called to believe in Jesus in John chapter 3 and verse 16, part of what we're being called to do is to believe the revelation that comes through Jesus Christ. This message that Nicodemus needed to hear that he did not understand, but that he needed to grasp so that he could have a part in the kingdom of God. Look at the very next verse. John chapter 3 and verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. If we're going to believe in Jesus, we've got to believe in the significance of the Old Testament. Not only do we have to believe in the Old Testament, we've got to believe in the significance and the purpose of the Old Testament. Too many Christians have this idea today that the Old Testament somehow is not worthy of our study. Uh, some of our more skeptical friends would, would say, well, the Old Testament has a different God than the New Testament. Which God is the true God? Who can even know? And so we kind of just toss out both of them. Contrast both of those opinions with how Jesus interacted with Scripture. And Jesus calls to mind this story from the Old Testament, chapter 3 and verse 14, a story from Numbers chapter 21. And Jesus talks to us about it as though it's what? As though it's actual history. He doesn't view it as metaphor. He doesn't view it as symbolism. He doesn't view it as imagery. He views it as reality. This is what happened. Moses lifted in the wilderness, and in the same way, Jesus says, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Jesus treats the Old Testament as real. He is addressing Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee and a teacher in Israel. Jesus knows Nicodemus, knows his Old Testament, and so Jesus is able to reference an Old Testament story without any sort of deep explanation. He just casually references the story of the bronze serpent in Numbers chapter 21. And Nicodemus gets it. He knew his scriptures. Secondly, not only does Jesus treat the Old Testament as real, he identifies himself as the focus of the Old Testament. Right? As the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, Jesus then draws a line of connection. Even so, the Son of Man must be lifted up. That is, he is saying that what happened in Numbers 21 prefigured what he would do. We would use the language of a shadow and a reality, or an antitype and a type. That Jesus says all of this that was going on was actually happening to point people and to draw people to me. Jesus draws this line of connection between the bronze serpent and himself. But when people look upon him, as Jesus makes clear in chapter 3 and verse 16, when people look upon him, they're not merely healed of some superficial wound, but they're granted eternal life. Such a story is magnified when we rightly understand it. When we understand the precursor to something better, something infinitely more important. 
Uh, Paul captures this same idea. Just look at it with me very quickly in Romans chapter 10. We made reference to Romans 10 earlier. Look at Romans chapter 10, this time verse 4. Romanos capitulo 10, verso 4. Romans chapter 10. And in verse 4, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says this. He says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. This is in a context where, where Paul is seeking the salvation of his uh, Israelite brethren. He notes that they had a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They forgot about God's righteousness. They sought to establish their own righteousness. They did not submit to the righteousness of God. They have not submitted to Jesus, but the point of Paul in Romans chapter 10 and verse 4 is when you rightly understand the Old Testament, Christ is the end. The telos is the Greek word there. He is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That, that word there for end, telos, it, it's a word that often invokes the idea of a purpose or a goal, and that's what's happening in this passage. Uh, Paul's point in Romans chapter 10 and verse 4 is not that, that Christ's death on the cross was the chronological end to the Old Testament. Uh, we might be able to say that in some, some way, shape, or form, but that's not the point. That's not the primary point of Romans chapter 10 and verse 4. The primary point of Romans chapter 10 and verse 4 is that the Old Testament scriptures were looking forward to something greater than the sacrifices and the offerings of animals. They were looking forward to the servant of, of Yahweh. They were looking forward to the suffering servant that Isaiah talks to us about. They were looking forward to the prophet whom God would raise up like Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 18. They were looking forward to the son of man in the book of Daniel. They were looking forward to the Messiah. The purpose of the law, and we can read Galatians chapter 3, for instance, was to prepare people for the Christ who was to come. But once he comes, and once he comes in his fullness, the Old Testament has served its purpose. The Old Testament, in fact, recognizes that, doesn't it? Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 31, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will create a new covenant with the house of Israel. The Old Testament scriptures themselves indicated they were going away. It was going to be eclipsed by something greater and something better. The Old Testament scriptures were never intended to be the end-all, be-all for humanity. That is part of what Jesus is trying to communicate to Nicodemus. That is part of what Nicodemus is struggling with. But in trying to set everything straight here, Jesus is not telling Nicodemus that the Old Testament is useless or purposeless. Jesus draws richly from the history of the Old Testament, including here in John chapter 3, when he references the story of the bronze serpent. As the serpent was lifted up by Moses in the wilderness, then Jesus draws the connection, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. The point is simple. The Old Testament helps us better understand and better appreciate Jesus, his work, and the wonderful things that come through him. When we're called to believe in Jesus like we are in John chapter 3 and verse 16, we're called to believe in the significance and the reality of the Old Testament. Then come to verse 16 with me. And let's just work through this text for a few moments that we have left. John chapter 3 and verse 16. When we're called to believe as we are in John chapter 3 and verse 16, we're called to believe in the love of God. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him should have eternal life. Chapter 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world. When we're called to believe in John chapter 3 and verse 16, we're called to believe in the love of God. A love that as we look here at chapter 3 and verse 16, a love that is for the world. A love that is for everybody. It shouldn't be lost on us that Jesus is in a discussion here with a Pharisee. 
And the, the Pharisees were, were really created at, at the beginning as a movement to oppose the, the kind of Greek influences seeping in to Jewish life. And so you had a very natural tension between the Pharisees and between everyone else that they kind of viewed as outsiders. So much so that if they brush up against an outsider, what did these Pharisees believe you had to do? You had to wash. You had to be purified from touching those who they viewed as being unclean. Certainly, there were many among the Pharisees who would have struggled with the idea of a God who loved everybody. I hope that wasn't the case with Nicodemus. I, I get the sense here with Nicodemus that he's somebody who's looking for something better and is intrigued by what Jesus has to say. But there were many of his brethren in the, the party, the Pharisees, who looked over the landscape of Jerusalem and Israel at that time and saw a lot of people that they didn't have to love. Do you remember the, the, the question that is posed to Jesus in Luke's gospel account? Who is my neighbor? Right, That stems from this very struggle that so many had with understanding the reality that God loves everybody. Notice here what we learned about the love of God, that God's love is real. For God so loved, in this way God loved the world. He so loved the world that He gave. We learn about the love of God, that it's an active love, that it's a real love, that this is not simply a love in, in word and in tongue, as John will later say, but it's a love in deed and in truth. Is love really love if it's not expressed? Not expressed in action. We can say that we love someone or something, but if our actions don't confirm that, John, uh, later in his epistle, in his first epistle, will tell us, what kind of love is useless? It's not really love. But true love is active, and that's what we see in the love of God. God so loved the world. He loved the world to this degree that he gave. His love is real. His love is active. He sent his only son. And his love is universal. God so loved the world. There's no one, there's no one who falls outside the purview of God's love. That includes sinners, doesn't it? Because each and every one of us who are Christians were at one point a what? A sinner. And the only reason we are not sinners today is why? Because of the love of God. God demonstrates His own love towards us, Paul says in Romans 5, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. We need to believe in the love of God. We need to believe you look at John chapter 3 and verse 16 in the devastation of sin. And you may be saying, well, Tyler, John 3, 16 doesn't say anything about sin. And you're right that the text does not have the word S-I-N in there. But we see the effects of sin in John chapter 3 and verse 16. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not, what? Perish, but have everlasting life. That what is presented to us here in John chapter 3 and verse 16 are two different results for two different lives. Here is a life of belief in Jesus that leads to everlasting life. Here is a life that does not believe in Jesus that leads to death. That whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's the contrast here between eternal life and perishing. Now we need to make one point. I want you to come to Matthew chapter 25. Let's, let's supplement this with what we see over in Matthew 25. Matteo capitulo 25. Matteo capitulo 25. Verso 41. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41. When Jesus talks here about the contrast between eternal life and perishing, 
Jesus is not so much contrasting quantity as he is quality. Let me try to explain that a little bit better if that's, if that's unclear. Jesus is not saying that, that one of these existences is going to be eternal and one of them is going to be not eternal. Now, listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 25 to make that a little clearer. Matthew 25 uh, and verse, let's see, let's look over here at verse 41. He will say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the what? Into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 46, these will go away into what? Eternal punishment. The righteous will go away into eternal life. Jesus is very clear that, that at the end of this life, our eternal existence will be in one of, of two existences, and it will be eternal, whichever, whichever existence we take part in. So then we come back to John chapter 3, and when he talks here about perishing or life, the, the point is not a, a quantity of duration. He's talking about a quality of existence. Just the same thing in Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 2. A quality of existence. Is, is my existence going to be described as life? Or is it going to be described as death? In James chapter 2, what is death? Death is death is separation. Will my eternal existence be one of life with God or separation with God? Whatever it is, it becomes evident. Sin is devastating. Sin, John chapter 3 and verse 16, separates us from God. That's part of what we have to believe. It's part of why we come to Jesus, right? We come to Jesus, we believe in Jesus. Why? Because we believe that He can save us from our sins. Now, if we're going to say that He can save us from our sins and then and that we have sin in our life and we've got to get rid of our sin, we've got to turn from that sin. Well, to find that S-I-N word, we're going to have to go out of John chapter 3 and verse 16, aren't we? And that's going to let us know there's more to this whole story than merely John chapter 3 and verse 16. But understand that by implication, John chapter 3 and verse 16 even talks to us about sin. The devastating effects of sin, that sin leads us to eternal separation from God. Believing in Jesus requires me accept requires me accept the danger and the reality of sin. But believing in Jesus also requires me to believe in the salvation that's available in Jesus. It's not just believing in him as a person, it's not simply believing in facts about his life, but believing in what I can attain through him, what he offers that I can share in. John chapter 3 and verse 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus points Nicodemus. Do you get this? He doesn't point him to Moses. To whom does Jesus point Nicodemus? He points him to himself, which fits with the significance of the Old Testament, pointing towards Jesus. Here, Jesus doesn't turn Nicodemus' eyes back to Moses, but he turns Nicodemus' eyes towards himself, towards Jesus. This is part of Nicodemus' confusion going back to the beginning of the chapter. Nicodemus questions, how can I possibly be in any more Jewish than I already am? And Jesus' answer is that salvation does not come based on a lineage that tracks back to Abraham, but salvation comes upon the basis of faith in me. And that's what Jesus is impressing upon Nicodemus. If I'm to believe in Jesus, I must believe in Jesus as the author and the finisher and the provider of salvation. And then finally, if I'm going to believe in Jesus, I've got to believe in the entirety of Jesus' message. Now we've already kind of indicated this, but how, how inconsistent would it be? 
to say, I believe in Jesus. But then I don't listen to anything else that he has to say. If I believe in Jesus, if I really, truly believe in Jesus, I'm going to listen to what he has to say. I'm going to live a life that emulates what he did. I'm going to walk in his steps like we see in 1 Peter. But I want you to see that we can establish this in the context of John chapter 3. Sometimes, and I think it's rightly so, we, we, we feel we do a disservice to a text by just reading a verse and then jumping off all sorts of other places that we don't really deal with the text. Well, stay here in John chapter 3 with me. Work through the text a little bit more. Listen to what the context tells us about believing in Jesus. Look at the very end of chapter 3. Look at the very end of chapter 3. I want you to look at verse 36. Capitulo tres, verso uh, 36. John chapter 3 and verse 36. We get a basic re restatement of what we see in John chapter 3 and verse 16 in verse 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. Okay. But he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You notice the subtle change that Jesus does there? This is parallelism. This is speaking the same thing, just using different words, same message. He who believes in the Son will have everlasting life. The counter to that, he who what? Well, in John 3, 16, it's he who does not believe, he who disbelieves. But in chapter 3 and verse 36, it's evident that belief embraces what? Obedience. He who does not obey the Son shall not see life. You know what that tells me? It tells me in Jesus' own words, in the words here of Scripture, that there's more to this idea of belief than just mental activity. Don't get me wrong. So much of what we have studied this morning is about what occurs up here, isn't it? But whether or not I choose to believe in Jesus' revelation, whether or not I choose to to believe in the Old Testament, whether or not I choose to believe that God loves me, whether or not I choose to believe that sin is real and sin is dangerous and sin is destructive, whether or not I choose to believe that salvation comes through Jesus, all of that takes place up here. Let's make sure we don't minimize the necessity of belief. Belief is crucial. Belief is vital. Belief is absolutely necessary. But as I look in the same context at John chapter 3 and verse 36, I find that obedience is necessary and vital and absolutely required. And so if I'm going to listen to the entirety of Jesus' message, I'm going to look, for example, at what Jesus said in Luke chapter 24. In Luke chapter 24, in verse 47, Lucas capítulo 24, verso 47. Thus it is written in that the Christ should suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and that what? Repentance and remission of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You know what Jesus You know what else Jesus called us to do? Repent. You know what word I never find in John chapter 3 and verse 16, but I think all of my religious friends would agree with me is absolutely necessary. Repent. But it's implied in this idea of belief in John chapter 3 and verse 16, and it's implied in John chapter 3 and verse 36 when we're called upon to obey the Son. I must repent. Marcos capítulo 16, verso 16, Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. 
God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16, Mark 16, 16. Go unto all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Isn't that John chapter 3 and verse 36 about obeying the Son or not obeying the Son? This is not about taking the words of Jesus and trying to prioritize which is the most important, which is the least important. But rather, this is simply about seeing what Jesus has communicated in Scripture and saying, whatever he says to me, that's what I'm going to do because I believe in him. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Belief, repentance, baptism, Mark 16, and obedience throughout the rest of our lives, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. We need to believe in Jesus. We need to believe in who Jesus is and what Jesus has revealed. We need to believe in the devastating power of sin. We need to believe in the great grace of God. We need to believe in the Old Testament, the significance and the meaning and the purpose of the Old Testament. But our belief is not complete. Our belief is not complete until it's coupled with obedience. And that's what, that's what John reveals to us in chapter 3 and verse 36. We've got to believe. We've got to obey. And when we join those two concepts together in our lives, in what God has said to us, that's how we can have the confidence of the eternal life that is promised to us in Christ Jesus. You look at your life this morning and you're outside of that relationship with God. If, if you have not given to Jesus what he calls on you to give to him, what better time is there than this morning than to make things right? If you believe in Jesus, are you willing to turn from a life of sin? Are you willing to confess him as your Savior, to be united with him in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life? If you're ready to do that this morning, we're ready to help you do that. Maybe as a Christian, you look at your life and you haven't been living as you should, but you want to come back to the one who loved you and gave himself for you. We can help you respond to the gospel in any way this morning. Would you come while we sing?